Buonasera a tutti, ho, ho il piacere di accogliervi alla seconda cattedra dell'anno 2013-2014 dell'Istituto Universitario Sofia col professor Donald Mitchell. Prima di tutto però devo darvi un paio di informazioni tecniche. Allora, la prima è che c'è una Ford targata BJ385FH che ha i fari accesi, quindi forse... E, e poi il professor Mitchell eh, farà l'intervento in inglese, quindi per chi non, è, non se la sente ecco, di sentire una lunga presentazione in inglese, e ci sono le cuffie che dovrebbero essere avanzate ancora per qualcuno e altrimenti c'è anche un testo scritto. Bene, Beh, per me vi dico con tutto il cuore che... Ah. Giusto. Io sono Paolo Frizzi, e, um, ho fatto il dottorato qui a Sofia in uh, e studi sul dialogo interreligioso. E, so, il preside mi ricorda, sono stato il primo dottorato di Sofia. E adesso insegno con uh, Vincenzo Di Pilato e Roberto Catalano e un corso sulla teologia delle religioni e del dialogo interreligioso. E, ecco, per me è particolarmente, è proprio emozionante presentare il professor Mitchell questa sera, e, perché ho iniziato a leggere i suoi libri dieci anni fa e ero ancora, e stavo ancora facendo il, il master, la specialistica, e Stavo provando a scrivere una, una tesi decente di, sul dialogo interreligioso, eh, non avendo esperienza sul campo. Quindi per me i, i libri del professor Mitchell e gli articoli sono stati un modo per eh, capire realmente cosa vuol dire fare esperienza di dialogo interreligioso. E ricordo in maniera chiarissima l'impressione che mi lasciarono alcuni passaggi dei suoi testi. Ad esempio e sono momenti che poi torneranno nella sua presentazione i resoconti dai Getsemani Encounters oppure lo speciale rapporto di dialogo, di amicizia di profonda eh, partecipazione spirituale che eh, il professor Mitchell ha avuto con il grande filosofo buddista giapponese Masao Abe o ancora le considerazioni profondissime sulla kenosi come via di dialogo tra cristianesimo e buddismo fondamenti che letteralmente mi spalancarono il pensiero verso quelle frontiere che rendono così speciale ed unica l'esperienza interreligiosa e che oggi penso sia la stessa esperienza che per voi. In quei, in quei primi mesi di studio, quel sapiente equilibrio che caratterizza la produzione scientifica di Donald Mitchell tra sfida teologica ed esperienza sul campo costantemente messa in relazione, mi sembrarono elementi irrinunciabili affrontando un argomento che ha il suo fulcro nell'incontro tra alterità. Eppure è ciò che troppo spesso manca proprio nella letteratura e nel dibattito sul dialogo e sulle relazioni interreligiose. E questo me ne sono reso conto profondamente negli anni successivi. E proprio tornando a studiare il dialogo interreligioso per il dottorato qui a Sofia, ecco, sono tornato agli scritti del professor Mitchell e ho ritrovato quell'equilibrio che mi colpì inizialmente. E lo recuperai, lo ritrovai come una prospettiva non solo affascinante, ma anche unica fondamentale, mi sembra, per chiunque voglia comprendere cosa significhi incontrare realmente l'altro. Quindi non solo andare alla frontiera del dialogo cristiano-buddista, ma, e qua mi permetto di affermarlo, andando decisamente al di là. Quindi cercando di scorrere anche solo per titoli la ricca biografia di Donald Mitchell, posso solo accennare ad alcuni momenti che mi sembrano chiave, sapendo che la lezione di oggi ne ripercorrerà le circostanze significative. Donald ora è professore emerito alla Purdue University negli Stati Uniti, in Indiana e consegue il dottorato alla University of Hawaii in filosofia asiatica comparata 
che è anche la sua materia principale di insegnamento. A partire dagli anni 70 si specializza negli studi sul buddismo, sul cristianesimo e sul, in particolare sul dialogo buddista-cristiano. Proprio in quel momento storico che vede il dialogo svilupparsi a livello globale come metodo privilegiato di incontro interreligioso e mette la sua esperienza a, e la sua competenza a servizio di quelle realtà che approfondiscono la teologia, la filosofia e l'esperienza prodotte dal dialogo. È stato consigliere del Pontificio Consiglio per il dialogo interreligioso proprio sul tema del dialogo tra fedi? È stato fondatore della Società per gli Studi Buddhisti Cristiani? Direttore dell'International del, dell Buddhist Christian Theological Encounter, un incontro teologico buddista cristiano, direttore di riviste internazionali e scrittore di saggi e di articoli. Il suo libro, Introduzione al Buddismo, che adesso è ormai la terza edizione, è un manuale fondamentale a livello globale per l'introduzione al buddismo e è usato ad esempio in università come Oxford. Poi è significativo per l'Istituto Universitario Sofia avere qui Donald Mitchell quest'anno. Per noi è un anno particolarmente speciale, ce lo ricordava anche il preside questa mattina, in quanto è un anno speciale per le religioni e per il dialogo interreligioso. Da pochi mesi abbiamo iniziato questo corso a più voci sulla teologia delle religioni, e riflessione teologica, esperienza sul campo, pensiero e prassi insieme e ci sembra che sta contribuendo a iniziare un intrigante originale proposta interdisciplinare di studi sulle religioni in sintonia con la missione e il metodo che lo Ius propone poi abbiamo avuto due visite importanti quest'anno un paio di mesi fa una delegazione di buddhisti di monaci buddhisti da Chiang Mai dalla Thailandia ci ha portato i, i testi sacri del, del buddismo per la nostra biblioteca e poi abbiamo avuto una profondissima lezione con il reverendo Nishio Takeuchi un leader religioso giapponese eh, buddista della tradizione Nichiren Shu quindi direi che il professor Mitchell è proprio inserito in questo contesto, in questo percorso di dialogo che viviamo costantemente a Sofia ed è in questo contesto che sentiamo la, la sua lezione. Grazie. So, buonasera. <laughs> While studying at the university, I met my wife Anne. We fell in love, we were married. She was a good Irish Catholic and introduced me to the Catholic faith. I'd attended a Protestant church as a child, but was not baptized, nor was I raised Christian. So I began to develop an interest in the question of the existence of God, whether God exists. Also at the university, I became interested in Buddhism. One of my professors taught me Zen meditation. So I had two dimensions in my new religious life. One was meditative dimension of Zen, and the other was a quest for the existence of a personal God. One night, when sitting in meditation, the thought came to me to pray to God and see what happens. I had not prayed since I was a small child, so I didn't know how to do it. So I simply asked God whether there is more to this life than what I had experienced. And at that time, what I experienced <laughs> disappeared. What I experienced was a, a life of struggle. A deep peace came over me that I had never known before or after. This happened at a time when I had to decide where to go to do graduate work in philosophy. The choice came down to the University of Hawaii where I could study Buddhism or another university where I could study Western philosophy, mainly European philosophy. 
One night, I was sitting in meditation uh, at a place by the ocean. I lived in San Diego, California. I had a strong and clear impression that God was asking me to go to the University of Hawaii and to study Buddhism, and that he would bring me back and use me for his own purpose. I didn't understand what this meant, but Anne and I and our son went to the University of Hawaii. I took coursework and did research on Buddhism and other Asian philosophies from 1967 to 1971. I also practiced Zen meditation at the Diamond Sangha of Robert Aiken. Robert Aiken is one of the patriarchs of, of Zen in the West. Under the guidance of a Zen master, Yasutani Roshi from Japan, I quickly realized that I'd entered a new world that was very foreign on the frontier, we would now say. There was chanting in Asian languages, walking meditation in line outside, sitting meditation for long periods of time facing a wall, bowing to others, to a statue, to our mat when we sat on it. A monk with a long stick would sometimes walk behind us, and if we requested by bowing, he would kneel behind us and hit us on our shoulders. We would then bow in gratitude for helping us to stay awake and to focus on our practice. At times, someone would hit a piece of wood hanging from the wall with a wooden hammer. Our practice was punctuated by bells and gongs and incense. At the conclusion, we would sit facing each other, sipping tea in silence. I thought, maybe this is too much for me, and maybe I need to leave. But again, I had a sense that this is what God wanted me to do. Eventually, all of this practice and its rituals affected me in a positive way, and I felt very much at home. I also think I'll add for the uh, the translator back there, <laughs> that I, um, I think that the ritualism of the Zen tradition helped prepare me for the Catholic Church, which I didn't have in the Protestant Church. In 1971, Ann and I and our family moved to Indiana near Chicago, where I took a professorship in the Department of Philosophy, teaching Asian philosophy and religion. My family, my work at Purdue, social life, and a small Zen sitting group seemed to meet my needs. I did remember my experience in San Diego of coming back and being used by God for his purpose. However, that didn't seem like a good idea to me at the time. And I resisted strongly. Then at one point, I had a serious personal crisis, and I saw no reason to continue living. Only when compared to death did the Catholic Church seem like maybe a good option. So it showed how much I struggled with, with, uh, with religion. I entered the church on August 27, 1974. A month later, Ann and I were invited to hear about the Focolari. I heard the story of the Focolari as well as the story of the person who was telling it. I was deeply moved, so was my wife. For me, the notion of God is love, living the present moment, loving all persons, unity, Jesus forsaken, the meaning of suffering, which is very important in Buddhism, resonated in some ways that I found precious in Buddhism. I concluded that here was a spirituality I could practice that was not a denial of the truths that I had found in Buddhism. Plus, Anne and I and our children could practice something together as a family. And we can contribute to a more united and peaceful world. Anne and I began going to local Focolari meetings, and we went to the Mariopolis in 76. There, the charism came alive for me and we returned home a new people. At this point, I was wondering again about this inspiration I had uh, about going to Hawaii and studying Buddhism and that God would bring me back to use me for his own purpose. 
I learned that the folklore was involved in dialogue with other religions. I was also aware that there was a new field of study in, in the world, um, beginning at the University of Hawaii, called Buddhist Christian Studies. I decided to talk to someone about interreligious dialogue who knew about it, my friend Raimondo Panikkar, who was famous for his work on dialogue with Hinduism. He's also a Jesuit. I mention that because of Pope Francis. So um, he said to me that since I had a history of practicing Buddhism and now Christian spirituality, and I'd studied the Buddhist side, it'd be good to study Christian spirituality. So I won a year off for studies with the Jesuits, Dominicans and Franciscans at the Graduate the Theological Union in Berkeley. And a grant included a practicum, doing something practical for part of the year. Therefore, I just uh, finished my studies in 78, and we came here to Lopiano in 1978. My wife and I, and at that point we had three children, small children. I worked fixing electric meters down the street. I took six screws out, and I put six new ones in for four hours. Um, I listened to talks on the formation and also talks by Chiara and did some work at the women's college. My children went to the local school with the uh, Piazza children and uh, Rod and Mazzia's children, you know, and the other children that were here in Lopiano. It was an extraordinary experience. Sometimes I would go outside of the house. They moved us from one house to another and look around to try to comprehend what I was inside. It was like being inside God, and I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Then Kiara came to visit. Our family met her as she walked to see the cloistered nuns. For me, it was a meeting with Jesus forsaken and risen, whom I've tried to follow for the rest of my life. I wrote a letter to Kiara asking whether she wanted me to help with the dialogue. She sent me a message saying yes, and wrote some guidelines for me to follow. It was shortly after that that I accepted my vocation to be a married Focalarino. <clears throat> Moving ahead a little bit for the translator. A group of Hindu members of the Gandhian movement came to Lopiano for a visit near my end of my stay in Lopiano. I thought, okay, this is my first chance to try dialogue. When the Hindu guests got off the bus, I went over and began talking to some of the men. I let them know that I was a professor. Professore, molto importante. <laughs> who taught Buddhism, or Hinduism, and would be glad to talk to them about their religion. They looked at me in silence and moved away. <clears throat> then I noticed a Focalarina went up to a Hindu woman, and they seemed to be best friends talking. I asked her, I said, do you know this woman? She said, no, I don't know her. I was just loving her. I was surprised, but I was a little bit angry. I'm the one that knows about Hinduism, and they want to talk to this woman who knows nothing, niente. <laughs> <clears throat> that night, I decided that I would follow the Focal Arena's example and just love the guests and not talk about religion. The next two days, that is what I did as I drove people around the city and answered their questions and emptied myself of my knowledge <clears throat> and ego and made myself one with them caring for their needs. Let me get some more, excuse me. On the last night, I was at a table at a women's college with a group of Hindus and one Focalarina sitting across from me. She motioned to me, let's keep Jesus in our midst. I nodded. Soon the conversation stopped. The elder Hindu at the head of the table said, I feel the presence of God here. The other Hindus nodded in silence. I understood that my self-emptying love had 
contribute to the conditions for Jesus in our midst. The focal arena affirming that she was ready to keep Jesus in the midst with me brought his presence among us, <clears throat> and the Hindu guests felt it. Then we went to see a video of Kiara. A Hindu woman was sitting beside me, asked me about a crucifix on the wall beside the movie screen. I told her something I don't remember. It had to do with the idea of kenosis or self-emptying love for the suffering of humankind. She said to me, that's like the self-emptying of our ego selves so that we can find the divine deep inside of us and discover our unity with all the things outside of us. I was surprised by her profound words. I realized that the focolari way of dialogue was to love first, love by losing everything, to be one with the other. Then, if we have Jesus in our midst, he is the presence of light that brings about his dialogue. I returned home and for the next six years lived focolari spirituality and researched Buddhist Christian dialogue. In 1984, I went to the first Buddhist Christian dialogue in Hawaii. I presented a pair, uh, paper comparing the spiritual life of both traditions in which I mentioned Kiara Lubick. I tried each day to live intensely the Focolari method of dialogue. Each time I arrived by car at the conference, I would stop and greet the parking attendant in order to be the first to love before reaching the conference and to remind myself that I should love everybody at the conference, whether a janitor, parking lot attendant, or Hans Kuhn. I don't know which is better. This was especially true with the Buddhist who are sensitive to this kind of mentality. I spent so much time uh, with the Buddhist that I found that they would talk about internal Buddhist issues while I was there because they felt that I was one of them. In fact, mentioning Hans Kung, he came up to me and invited me to lunch because he thought I was a Buddhist. He was very disappointed when I said I was a Catholic. <laughs> the fruits of this encounter were clear. I was invited but to be part of a small group of scholars who created the Society for Buddhist Christian Studies in this journal, of which I became the associate editor. John Cobb, a very famous uh, Protestant theologian, Masao Abe in in invited me to join what was called the Abe Cobb Group, the group of the top Protestant theologians uh, in America, led by John Cobb, and the top Buddhist scholars in Japan, led by Masao Abe. Later, I was chosen to be director of the group and changed the name to the International Buddhist Christian Theological Encounter. I was also able to invite Buddhists from other traditions, Tibet, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and Sri Lanka. And finally, I was received many invitations to lecture in Japan. So now I want to uh, turn to the this adventure in uh, my lectures in Japan. But I realize I haven't pushed these, the button here as we're doing this. This is Robert Aiken Roshi at the Diamond Sangha, that it was the, the first uh, Zen center where I practiced. And this is Yasutani Roshi, the teacher, uh, Zen master under which I, I studied. He was a very severe man. <laughs> And here's Raimondo Panikar that I called for, uh, for advice. And here's John Cobb and Masao Abe, the Abe Cobb group. Now, the first person I want to talk to, uh, to you about is Geshen Tokiwa, and also related to him, Shinichi Hisamatsu. This is not Geshen Tokiwa. I could not find a picture of Geshen Tokiwa. So this is a Zen monk, the back of a Zen monk doing meditation. So that's the best I could do. So just pretend this is Geshen Tokiwa. He's a professor of Zen Buddhism at Hanazono University in Japan and president of the FAS Society. I'd met him in, in uh, Hawaii. 
the FAS Society was very famous, and especially because of the founder, Shinichi Hisamatsu, who was a member of what I'll talk about later called the Kyoto School. And I want to say a few things about Hisamatsu, and as I, as I talk about this, I want you to think about the Focolare movement and see the tremendous similarities between Hisamatsu and Kara Lubick and the Focolare movement. Hisamatsu was born in 19, 1889. He attained enlightenment in Zen and the tradition in 1915. During World War II, students at the Kyoto University were in crisis over the war and went to him for guidance in 1942 and 1943, at the same time here in Trent, yeah, the bombings. <clears throat> they experienced that the students and the teacher became one, according to one of the students, Masao Abe, who I'll talk about later. As one, they sought for what it is to be a human being, how they could live this oneness together as true human beings were meant to live. They sought together under the guidance of Hisamatsu how to awaken to their true self, joining hands as brothers and sisters, free from any discrimination against others, vowing to construct a world in which everyone can live truly and fully. In 1958, Hisamatsu named this organization the FAS Society. F stands for formless self. In Buddhism, this means waking to our true self <clears throat> that isn't formed by nationalism, racism, or things that divide us, where we can find peace and unity with humanity. A stands for all humankind. This means the unity of all humankind as a basis for solving social problems rather than perspectives from one class or group or nation or race. S stands for creating a new history on the basis of a reality that is super historical, that is beyond history. The super historical basis is a foundation of unity that transcends the ups and downs of history. Hisamatsu called this ideal a postmodern age. This is decades before the word postmodern age was uh, used. And he worked for it until he died in 1980. He sought to build a community united in his destiny as one living entity through the end, uh, kenosis of individualism. The modern world is built on individualism, nationalism, and rational selfhood postmodern age would be built on a broader compassion and luminous standpoint of unity by a communal spirituality that can produce a new and united human community. This spirituality needs what he called, Hisamatsu called, active love that gives oneself to others as a gift rather than passive love that seeks to be loved by others as an object. This active love is like fire, he said. Here's what he said about the fire of love. It will be warm and congenial if we spread this warmth externally in the same way as a charcoal fire lights in one spot and spreads, everyone in the room will become warm and each of us become a charcoal fire. This warmth can extend to those around us the places we find ourselves and the places to where we go. Geshen Tokiwa invited me to speak to the FAS Society in Tokyo after reading uh, Kiara Lubick in my papers and getting to know me. He saw the similarity between FAS and the Focolari at a deep level. One night, we went to a building where the FAS Society practiced meditation. It was in a large Zen monastic complex. There were no lights at all. It was pitch dark. We walked down the street, and you could see the dark forms of temples like huge ghosts in the night. The building where we met had candlelight, but the walls only came up halfway. The rest of it was all open to the ceiling, and the wind blew through, and it was the middle of winter. 
When I gave my talk, I could see my breath. But the winter blowing and being cold, it's part of the Zen practice. <laughs> my comments on the similarities between Hisamatsu and, uh, were on Hisamatsu, the similarities between Hisamatsu and, and Kiara. That were my comments. It was well received, and the editor of their famous journal, The Eastern Buddhist, asked if they could publish my paper. It was the first paper ever to be written by a Christian to be published in this Buddhist journal. Tokiwa became a close friend and collaborator. He stressed that the Zen distinction between our ordinary way of being and our original way of being, the former is tainted by failings of ourselves and the world in which we live, the latter, our original way of life, the true way of being, how we were originally created, is free from these negative conditions. This original way of living, according to Tokiwa, is shown to the world by two women, Maya, the mother of the Buddha, and Mary, the mother of Christ. In Buddhism, there's a term, Tathagatagarbha, means womb of the Buddha. Lady Maya was the womb of the Buddha. The Tathagata is a title of the Buddha that literally means thus come into the world, that is, has come into the world. And so Maya is the womb by which the Buddha thus came into the world. Mary is the womb by which Christ thus came into the world. For Tokiwa, we all have Tathagatagarbha within ourselves. That is, we can all be a womb that brings Buddha or Christ into the world following the model of Mary or Maya. How can they be a model for us? They were both empty of themselves, loving, compassionate, free from the distortions of the world. If we become like them, then we too can discover our original self and become a womb or a place where the Buddha or Christ can be born into the world. And like for Kiara, there is a communal element to Tokiwa's thought. When human beings together realize their collective womb, so people together become like a collective uh, womb uh, of mutual self-giving love, they will realize that they can be a collective womb of unity, the unity of all beings. And this will liberate humankind from the painful history we have lived with its terrible wounds to a postmodern history of love, liberation, unity, and peace. About Mary, Tokiwa writes, Mary is not just a woman, is not just a specific person, but Mary stands for all human beings, all humanity, the same humanity that always gives rise to this suffering and causes suffering can be the mother of the Son of God, this is my point of view. Now comes the most amazing insight of Tokiwa about Mary as being a model for maternity. Where does she, he see this? At the birth of Christ? No. He says, When I have a chance to see Christian paintings of the Pieta, I am deeply moved by the eternal truth of humanity, the mother of God embracing and watching and finally collapsing at the sight, the mother of God, embracing, watching, and finally collapsing at the sight of the son who died bearing the cross of all beings. In fact, St. Mary, I see, in St. Mary, I see what Buddhists call the Buddha's womb. So it's not, it is in this, ultimate kenosis of Mary desolate that Tokiwa sees the perfect model, the Marian model for giving birth to Christ. It's very profound for a Buddhist to, to see this. I want to share one last experience uh, with Tokiwa. He was a member of the Abe Kab group. We once met at a monastery of Fokwang Shan in California. It's a Taiwan uh, Buddhist group. It was Sunday and uh, those of us that were Catholics had a mass in the living room of the guest house. After the mass, the priest came up to me and said, Tokiwa came into the room and sat down to watch. 
During the Eucharistic part of the Mass, he started to cry. Go to him and ask, and ask why he was crying. Now, you need to know, Tokiwa is an old-style Zen Buddhist. He shows no emotion. He's extraordinarily stern. So I asked him, what was his experience? He paused for a while, and then he said slowly, the deepest reality of infinite love. Now, I would add that it is my experience that many Buddhists accept the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Not long ago, I was at a dialogue at Gethsemane Abbey, the home of Thomas Merton. Each day after the dialogue, we would process out of the chapter room, cross the church into the refectory. The Dalai Lama would always stop in the church and bow in reverence to the tabernacle. On the final day of the dialogue, when he uh, was passing through the church for the last time, he bowed deeply. Then as he approached the door, he turned around, and with a huge smile, he waved goodbye to the tabernacle, as if there was somebody there that he was waving goodbye to. So that's the first person I wanted to introduce you to, Geshen Tokiwa. The next is Keiji Nishitani. For some time before my trip to Japan, I had been in correspondence with Keiji Nishitani. He was one of the most famous of the Japanese philosophers. You're right, I need to push it. This is Hisamatsu. <laughs> Sorry. Without beard and with beard. This is Keiji Nishitani. Nishitani was a student of, um, he studied for two years under um, uh, uh, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger. This is a picture of Martin Heidegger here. There's an essay by Martin Heidegger about his dialogue with the Japanese. And th this is Nishitani he's talking about. Nishitani was one of the most famous of the uh, Japanese philosophers of the 20th century. At one point, I sent him some meditations of Kiara. <clears throat> when it came to my visit to Japan, Tokiwa accompanied me to, him, to his home. We sat down and had an extraordinary conversation. In fact, it later became published in what is now Vatican's Pro Dialogo? Dialogo? Yeah. Dialogo. Journal uh, with the title Compassionate Endurance, Mary and the Buddha, a Dialogue with K.G. Nishitani. At one point he said to me, I have read the readings of Kiar, writings of Kiar Lubick. I think we're both saying the same things. We're both working for the same thing. Then he turned to Tokiwa and he said, you know, she was in Trent, Italy during World War II. And during the bombing, she went to the bomb shelters. There she had her conversion. So she had read read quite a bit about Kiara. Nishitani writes a great deal about kenosis or self-emptying, a Christian notion. So I mentioned that in the Focolari we talk about being merry, emptying ourselves of our ego so that Jesus is born in us in our relations with other people. In our true humanity we can be this womb as a new spiritual life. The self-emptying reflects the essence of God, who is a dynamic Trinitarian activity of love. We also empty ourselves before others in order to reflect this love of God to them, to become united with them, reflecting a communal image of the Trinity. I asked Nishitani, you speak of the movement from self-centeredness to other-centeredness that reflects the compassion of ultimate reality. Are the notions of Kiara's and yours similars, similar? And he answered, yes, they are. Then I ask, if we do this together with others, are we creating what you call a field of force that gathers humanity together in its one true home ground to find our home together united? He answered, this is his answer, yes. And when we attain this deeper realization of unity, we find the fundamental truth of community, of what has been called circumcisional interpenetration. So he's actually using a Christian terminology. This is to be aware of the fundamental way of being, of unity. This perichoresis is then this fundamental way of being human. 
Here, in unity, each person can realize his or her true self. But the true self is always other-centered, so it also means to become aware of the true freedom of our being. To discover our true self is at the same time the realization of true unity. It is, in fact, the self-realization of unity itself. So when we have unity among us, it's the self-realization of God's unity. The self-realization of unity itself. In Christian terms, when we experience unity, it is the self-realization of the unity of God love among us. Nishitani went on to say that the historical necessity of today is to open a broader foundation, communication, and perspective, where in his words, we can see each other as brothers and sisters. He then asked me if the self-realization of unity among Buddhists is Buddha in the midst, while among Christians is, as Kiara says, Jesus in the midst. We both said we don't know how to answer that question. But Nishitani said that we're now at a crossroads of something new. Buddhists and Christians are meeting at the crossroads of history. The important thing is not what we call this unity, Buddha or Christ, but rather that we gain a new global vision to embrace all humankind in unity. The unity needs to be found, he said, both in the heart <coughs> and the hearth, focolari, use the word focolari. The hearth, using uh, Kiara's word, he concluded, the hearth, the focolari, is the center of the whole human family. The heart is the center of our body. Finally, I asked Nishitani, in light of Kiara's emphasis on Jesus forsaken in unity, what uh, was his view of the role of suffering in love and unity? He answered that by overcoming our ego-centeredness, living compassionately for others becomes the fundamental ground of our lives. Then we find a unity in which the suffering of others becomes our suffering. We identify with all who suffer, just as Jesus did on the cross. We discover the truth of suffering, and this takes compassionate endurance for us as human beings. He concluded, Mary is the model of this compassionate endurance of suffering for the good of others. Following her way with endurance, we find true wisdom. Indeed, Mary is the seed of wisdom. So, <clears throat> that ends my journey to Japan. And um, so, in 1986, uh, after being in Japan, uh, my wife and I and our children, and my mother, as a matter of fact, who had lost my father a few months before, spent four uh, months in Gota Farata. Uh, we lived in an apartment, and I worked, uh, went to work at the Center for Interreligious Dialogue. There I worked with Enzo Fondi and Natalia Dello Piccola, uh, who were responsible for interreligious dialogue. I'm going to skip a little bit for the interpreter now. Um, I also met uh, Giuseppe Zanghi one of the early, I'm probably saying Zanji, Zanghi, Zanghi, sorry, uh, one, one of the early academic leaders of the Focolari. We had a conversation about Asian religions and he invited me to meet with him in his office every other week. At our first meeting, he asked me if I've ever heard of something called Paradise 49. I said I'd not. And he said, I'm going to read you sections. This is of a, of a mystical period in Kiara's life. If the words enter you, fine. If not, they'll come back to me. I had no idea what he was talking about. But as he read, I found myself being filled with his words. I could only hold so much, and we had to conclude our discussion. For days, I would process the spiritual insights that I'd heard and think deeply about it and relate it to Buddhism. 
our next meeting, I would show him some drawings, some scribblings that I'd made and uh, some other things, and we would talk about it, and then we'd read some more. And then this continued until I departed for home. But what he shared became the basis of my future writings in um, Buddhist Christian dialogue. And my first major publications were based on, on what he told me. Finally, Enzo introduced me to Father Marcelo Zago, who at the time was the secretary for what is now the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. After he got to know me and my work and ideas, he introduced me to Cardinal Lorenzo and to Father John Shirieda, who was responsible for Asia. We became friends. My time in Rome opened up these new horizons for further dialogue. I again remembered God telling me to go study Buddhism and he would bring me back to use me for his own purpose. The last person I want to mention uh, in the dialogue is Masao Abe. Now, now I will remember to push this. Some people think Remember in Star Wars, there's that little um, Yoda? Some Yoda. people think that Yoda was made after him because uh, he was very famous at the time Star Wars was filmed. So, anyway, and he was very wise. When I turned to the United States, um, I deepened my conversations with Buddhists. Um, uh, with Zangi, uh, Zan, Zangi, Zangi. This is worse than Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I published a book. I'm going to summarize this. I published a book called. Um, uh, spirituality and Emptiness, the spiritual, uh, spiritual Life of Buddhism and Christianity, which is a reaction to what Masao Abe was, was writing. He, was taught, he wrote a book, uh, or there's a book that has a famous essay by him called The Emptying God. And uh, it talked about how the emptiness of, of ultimate reality empties out entirely as this world, and there's nothing left. If there was anything left, then it wouldn't be total love. For to be total love, it has to be entirely emptied out. And I argued, well, if God empties himself out entirely, then we have no hope you know, for the future. You know, that, uh, and so he and I, we discussed this, and he gave me a copy of his book before it was published, and I used it to write my book. And eventually he came to live and work uh, with me at, uh, at Purdue University. So at the bottom of page 10 for the translator, he came to my university in 1991 to 93 till he retired and went back to Japan. My conversations with Abe began with discussions about Pseudo Dionysus's uh, notion of dazzling darkness. Abe said, that these words best describe the Zen experience of ultimate reality. The dazzling light of nirvana is identified with the darkness of our suffering world. We discussed how this identity could be seen in Jesus Forsaken. The kenosis of God on the cross does not destroy the dazzling luminosity of God, but identifies it with the universal suffering of humankind taken on by Jesus Forsaken. This is the high point of canonic love. With this conversation, our dialogue took a new turn. Abe expressed an interest to meet the Focolari community and to learn more about it. He saw a similarity between his thought and that of Chiara, and a similarity between the communal spirituality of the Focolari and also Hisamatsu, which he practiced. In 1992, Go a little slower, okay. In 1992, uh, he came to visit the Focolari in Chicago, and he also received a year later the Luminosa Prize for his work in dialogue at Luminosa, the Focolari Retreat Center in, in the United States. 
While in Luminosa, he was very impressed by the spirituality found there. And he made, began to make plans to go to uh, Rome. He wanted to meet Chiara and also perhaps the Pope. Abe asked if he could also meet Cardinal Ratzinger. He said that the Catholic theologians that he talked to were not in agreement about many different issues. And he wanted to find out what the true teaching of the Catholic Church was. In March of 92, the Abbes traveled to Rome. Enzo and Natalia hosted them. However, Chiara was in Switzerland undergoing medical treatment. Abbe did meet with the members of the Abba School, and they toured Lopiano. They came up here to Lopiano, he and his wife. Upon their return to Rome, they went to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, where Abbe discussed his philosophy with Birocoda and also Jacques. Jacques Servé. French. <laughs> S.J., Jesuit. Abbe was impressed with the openness of the church to his notion of kenosis, while admitting that there were differences. That, that uh, Piero said, well, there's some differences here, but at least they were taking him seriously. They were taking a Buddhist seriously, and that was important to him. At the end of the meeting, Cardinal Ratzinger joined them. He had just come back from Hong Kong and wanted to tell Abi he understood the historical significance of his interfaith work and confirmed the great importance, the confirmation that was of great importance to Abi. The Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue took the Abbe's to a semi-private audience with Pope Paul, John Paul II. I'm going to quote Abe's uh, account of the encounter with the Pope. The Pope warmly took my hands into his own and uttered, uttered a single Japanese word, arigato. See, that's easy to say. You know, Italian, French. <laughs> when the Pope turned to Ikuko, his wife, she told him that his presence has given her encourage, uh, given great encouragement for her life. She was suffering at the time. Uh, from some physical problems. To this the Pope said in an overwhelming attitude of love, let us carry the cross together. Abbe says, we were deeply moved by the Christian spirituality manifested by the Pope. Thus my visit to Rome was a landmark in my career in the Buddhist-Christian dialogue. Upon his return home, the Abbe's told me that when the Pope spoke this word, these words, let us carry the cross together, he felt that the Pope had entered the deepest part of his being. Abe also said he found a spiritual kinship of family with the Vocalari community in Rome, and from that time on he always referred to himself as a Buddhist friend of the Vocalari. So, that is the, um, the, my experience with the, uh, the Japanese tradition. I, I did want to just mention, here's the, some of the members of the Kyoto School. The first fellow over here on this side on the top, this is Nishida. He's the great founder back in the late 1800s. And he was the first person in Japan to open up to Western philosophy. And he focused on Hegel, so his work was on Hegel. The next one is uh, Tanabe, and he went to uh, he went and studied under Husserl, and in Germany, and he studied Kant. The next is Nishitani, who we talked about, and he folk he studied under uh, Heidegger, but he focused on uh, Nietzsche, the nihilism of the world. And then you have Hisamatsu, who didn't go to Asia, but developed a, uh, a spiritual uh, uh, tradition. And then you have uh, 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 Takeuchi, who did, uh, did the study of, of uh, Kierkegaard. And the next is Ueda, 
who studied um, Eckhart, Meister Eckhart. And then Suzuki, many, many of you might know from his writing, D.T. Suzuki, he, he was sent by the Kyoto School to come and bring this message to the West. And then after he died, Masao Abe was sent to do the same thing. So it's one of the great traditions. So, how much time do I have? We can stop here, but I can go on a little longer. Five minutes, okay. A little more than five minutes? 15 minutes stops. 10, 15 minutes stops. 10, 15? 15. 15 minutes. 20? 20. <laughs> this is a, we can bargain. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll move quickly through. Um, upon my return to uh, the United States, um, I'll summarize this so hopefully the interpreter can kind of go along with me. Um, there's an organization of Benedictines uh, signed by the Pope, uh, by the Vatican, to, to do dialogue with monastics, intermonastic dialogue. It's called Monastic Interreligious Dialogue, MID. And they had a long tradition of dialogue with the Dalai Lama and others. And in 1993, at the Parliament of the World's Religions, um, they used my book as a basis for dialogue on emptiness. And at that dialogue, the Dalai Lama said he wanted to have a week-long retreat at the home of his friend, uh, Thomas Merton. He and Thomas Merton met shortly before uh, Merton died in India. And uh, Gethsemane Abbey. And so MID asked that I help them to, to uh, invite people to, to the dialogue. So we um, invited many people from all the different traditions. So I've been working mainly with Japanese. Uh, I would mention uh, Mahagoshananda. Mahagoshananda was the supreme patriarch of Buddhism in Cambodia during what we call the killing fields. I don't know if that translates into Italian. This is when there was this um, killing of uh, this genocide in, in Cambodia. And he, he was in the various camps as the, as the, um, the Buddhist leader of, of, of Cambodia. And uh, one, of, one of the people that was at the uh, uh, Gethsemane encounter was a Zen master from Japan who had visited one of the camps and saw him at the camp and he was sitting and doing meditation. And so the Zen master asked him, this was at the uh, Gethsemane encounter, what were you doing sitting there in meditation, you know, with so much suffering around you? Sort of like, why weren't you out doing something? And he said, I was practicing Vipassana, insight meditation, going into myself to find the freedom be able to love the people that were around me in that very difficult situation. So we had some very profound uh, experiences. I was asked to give the opening address on the Christian side, even though I'm not a monk. I was the only non-monk in the group. Monkless man, so. Um, I talked about God, creation, and spiritual life. And in it, I quoted many things from Chiara. For example, I'll just mention one. The father empties himself out in total self-giving love into the son. The son does not cling to this loving affirmation, but empties it back into the father with total self-giving. This is the second of the two quotations for the interpreter. Both the father and son are fully in the dynamic of this mutual love and unity, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not cling to this mutual indwelling of the father and son, but returns all to the father and the son. In this way, all three abide 
in total non-obstructing freedom and mutual containment of indwelling. After I finished, the Dalai Lama, who was sitting beside, uh, behind me on the abbot's chair, <laughs> interesting, uh, stood up and put his hands together over his head like this, which is the highest honor a Buddhist can give to uh, another person. And later he told me that he greatly enjoyed my talk, and I had convinced him that if God is infinite love, then he could believe in God. Up until that time, he couldn't. But once he heard this, he said, now I can believe in God as infinite love. After the event, I uh, helped write the proceedings, and there were two more Gethsemane encounters on different topics. <clears throat> and then finally, I wanted to mention uh, my work with the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Um, they held three international Buddhist Christian colloquia. The first was in Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan. I was asked to help and to present the opening address there too. At the conclusion, Cardinal Rinze asked me to write the official document overnight uh, for the last meeting that would happen in the morning. He said, now, you need to write something that all the Buddhists will vote for and that I can take back and give to Cardinal Ratzinger and he would approve it too. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so I would add, the next morning um, I was to lead the, the, the vote and they decided to have sitting next to me a, a Zen uh, Zen uh, professor from Tokyo, uh, Professor Nara, who's the president of, of uh, uh, Tokyo University. And he's very mean and tough character. So I think he was like having a policeman with a cabinieri, you know, there. So vote for this. Um, there were two other dialogues uh, after this. W one was in outside of Bangalore at a Benedictine monastery on kenosis and Christianity. And then finally, there was one in, um, oh, I was going to mention uh, Shin, uh, Michio Shin, uh, Shinozaki. This is the first PCID in Taiwan, colloquium. And this is our friend, do you recognize uh, uh, Luce Ardente there, um, was present. So this is Machio Shinazaki of the Rishiko Sekai. Um, at this second dialogue, uh, he was talking about the lotus tradition. He noted that the one dharma, ultimate truth, is itself the power of integration. Whatever the ultimate reality is, is a power of integration, of integrating things. It integrates words, laws, and phenomena like a father uniting his children. Like Kiara, he notes that in the Tendai, the foundation, foundational Japanese sect for the Rishoko Sekai, the sounds of streams and wind, the looks of the moons and the flowers teach us the Buddha's Dharma. The integration is one of unity in diversity, an unexpected gift beyond which we normally seek and experience. In my own paper, I noted that for Chiara, this power of integration is charity, a current of fire that is poured into the human heart from Jesus crucified and forsaken, penetrates others, and becomes what Chiara calls mutual penetration, the same word used by Tendai and the other Buddhists. For Chiara, like Tendai and the Risho Kosekai, this mutual penetration is also experienced in the world of nature, not just ourselves. The third dialogue was held in 2002 at the beautiful headquarters of the Risho Kosekai in Tokyo. There I was asked to speak about uh, the church and the laity. I wanted to know what's the position of the laity in the church. We can talk about that for many 20 minutes. <laughs> um, 
By this time, the participants know each other well, and the hospitality of the Risho Kosekai was very gracious. I felt like it was the right place to complete the sequence of the colloquia, namely at the site where Kiara spoke many years before, opening a new relation between the Nuano family and herself, the Focolari, the Risho Kosekai, and the church. Finally, since 1980, I've been working with dialogue with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And let me conclude my paper with this short story uh, about the first time I met the Dalai Lama. It was in early 1980s, and he seemed most interested in what I had to say about the Focolari's work with youth. I talked to him about the Focolari. He'd been hosted by the Focolari at the um, Assisi uh, day of prayer for peace, and so I was there to tell him a little bit more about the people who hosted him. And um, so he wasn't so interested in the adults, he was interested in what we did with youth. So we talked about that, and he said to me, you know that we are entering a time when children will do terrible things to other children, things you cannot imagine. We need to do whatever we can to influence children to live good lives. It's not so important that we teach them doctrines. We need to teach them how to live. We can no longer trust that children will grow up with even a minimum sense of right and wrong. Looking back, I can see that his words were prophetic. At the time, I thought he was crazy. I didn't wonder, well, Dalai Lama's not crazy, but I. I didn't understand, but then we had in the U.S. Columbine and a number of other horrific uh, murders by children. My hope as the Dalai Lamas is that the religious lay movements of today, of all religions, that we may, sh uh, that have so many shared values, as I've tried to show in this paper, whether it's the FAS Society, Risho Kosekai, Fokwang Chan, Fokalari, can collaborate to build one family of humankind, caring for all children and all of nature too. When Kiara wrote, Be a Family, I think we need to see this as a prophetic call to include all humanity and all living beings. Grazie. Grazie Donald per questo viaggio affascinante, veramente affascinante. Yeah. Ah, abbiamo un break prima del dialogo, quindi un po' di, di musica. Allora, chiamo Bert Lankovash, e Ermel Jaworski e Federico Rovea per una melodia ebraica, e una melodia tratta da, da canti tradizionali ebraici. Violino, chitarra e cajon, studenti di Sofia.
grazie. Abbiamo tempo per qualche domanda? Se qualcuno se la sente di fare qualche domanda al professor Miceli, potete farla in italiano, poi noi traduciamo. Ringraziando per questa meravigliosa testimonianza così ricca che dice come seguendo lo spirito di Dio si cammina secondo la direzione del disegno di Dio sull'umanità e vedendo come sotto tanti avvenimenti così importanti del dialogo vissuti tra cristianesimo e buddismo in questi ultimi decenni c'è l'ispirazione del carisma dell'unità mediato dalla fedeltà e dall'intelligenza del professor Mitchell vorrei chiedere a lui che è qui adesso ospite di Lopiano dove tornate ospite di Sofia che cosa possiamo fare noi a Sofia che per Chiara è uno dei segni di una seconda fase della realizzazione dell'incarnazione dell'opera di Maria cioè quando ad Assisi si unisce Parigi alla spiritualità si unisce anche la cultura, lo studio il dialogo teologico che cosa possiamo fare noi per essere fedeli a questo dono e a questo impegno che ci è dato Well, um, well, let's see, you're going to translate. Yeah, oh, he translates. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's an always a danger going from Assisi to Paris, if you know Paris. <laughs> no, you didn't understand? There's always a danger of going from Assisi to Paris, if you know Paris. Yeah. Um, I think that what I found here at Sofia in the few weeks, two weeks that I've been here, uh, is a spiritual foundation uh, to the academic work that's being done. Um, and I think as, as long as that uh, spiritual foundation is there in terms of the life of, of Sofia, uh, then I think that um, these inundations, as, as we call it in English, uh, this movement of, of the thought of Chiara Lubick into, into uh, the various academic fields uh, will keep its foundation. Um, because the Buddhists... Uh, are interested in the, I, I'm speaking now in terms of the dialogue, Buddhists, Jews, Hindus that I've met, are interested in the, the ideas, but it's the spirituality that really moves them. Uh, and so that's what, you know, is, is the, the, has to be the foundation for, the, for, for real dialogue and collaboration for world peace and that. Um, and for that to be expressed in economics and political science and sociology and the different areas, I think is is uh, um, as you said is the is the next is the next step. Um, 
So, you know, I can just encourage you to keep going on and doing this. I, I would hope that, that eventually uh, Sophia will have what we call in the, in the United States satellite campuses. Um, like a satellite goes around the Earth. So you have a campus in the United States or a campus in Buenos Aires and so forth. Um, where the where the research and this the study can can enculturate within those within those those places. Uh, so I think you're you're doing the really hard part. Uh, before the satellites can happen, there needs to be the the Earth <laughs> around which the satellites go. There needs to be the Sophia here. You know, and and to to build that from from niente, from nothing, uh, not in the positive Buddha sense, but uh, <laughs> but uh, is is very difficult, and that's that's what you're in the middle of doing. Um, so I can just encourage encourage you to continue doing what I've seen. Uh, the discussion today of uh, the doctoral st uh, student after I gave a talk this morning uh, very much impressed me. Uh, the questions from the other students and the work together and working in unity uh, was, was very impressive. We don't have that kind of thing in a typical university. Um, so, yeah. Professor Mitchell, um, I try to, to speak in English because uh, I spent 12 years in Australia, but many years ago. Anyway, <laughs> I was uh, really impressed by just by the last page of your um, paper about the, uh, the children and what we have to do or how to change the trend of children uh, nowadays around the world. Uh, I think it's a, a, a great, our enemy is the consumerism and television, actually. But from your deep knowledge, uh, give us a hint uh, about how uh, can teach the new generation according the uh, Buddhism and uh, Christian uh, uh, trend or uh, religions. What do you suggest? Well, I wish I had an answer to <laughs> uh, that question. I, I can tell you that this is a topic, uh, I mean, this, this comment uh, to me was probably uh, in 1981, so that was a long time ago. Um, but in recent decades, uh, there has been much discussion in not just Buddhist Christian dialogue, but Jewish Christian dialogue. Uh, you think about what's happening with the, the youth leaving the Jewish faith um, and, um, and various problems in, uh, with uh, the soldiers in Israel coming back from, the, from uh, Palestine and so on. And, um, and, uh, and the Muslims, uh, we work in the United States, the Focolari is very close with the followers of W.D. Muhammad, which is, was, was once called the Nation of Islam, uh, started back in the 1930s with some very strange ideas with it, and, and, uh, but now it's been mainlined. Um, but most of their members are inner city uh, and they work with youth in, in those situations. And um, I, I think uh, consumerism is one thing, but I think that uh, another part of it is, is uh, two kinds of poverty, physical poverty, which generates a kind of desperation. I was talking to, in a dialogue with a, a young woman who's a member of Hamas, and um, my impression is that people turn to that kind of thing out of desperation. I mean, no rational person is going to blow themselves up. 
But if they feel like there's just nothing else that they can do, out of desperation they do do things. Um, but the other is, is a kind of spiritual dark night, spiritual poverty in the world uh, where there's uh, young people are bombarded with uh, violent games and other kinds of things constantly. Um, it used to be you'd walk across campus and people would be talking to each other. Now they're talking on their telephones, you know, and, and sort of a breakdown of, of, of uh, positive human interaction um, and also a breakdown of the family uh, structure, especially in the United States, you know, 50% of, you know, of people get divorced. So, um, and I think in Europe you have similar similar kinds of problems. So there's just a whole set of problems. And I, I do remember that that visit by the Gandhian Hindus here in Lopiano. They were very impressed with the young children in Lopiano. Uh, and they said, you know, you can tell if the spirit is healthy in a place by the children's behavior. And so, if the behavior of the children in many parts of the United States is, is not healthy, then there's something wrong with the spirit in America. Um, I'm speaking as an American, um, and, but it's true in other places too. Um, there's a lot of anger um, among adults. Uh, there's a lot of viciousness. There's a lot of hatred. And that resonate that that creates an environment where children uh, begin to do things that they just you know normally wouldn't do. So, so I, I I think we're in a kind of a dark spiritual night of of um, uh, of of our societies uh, due to whatever factors. It's, it's, it's up to a sociologist. I I don't know how, but I can just say that religious leaders all, we, were, we had a dialogue in Japan and all the Japanese Buddhist leaders wanted to talk about was the problems they were having with Japanese youth. And what can they do in, in, as Buddhists and what, you know, we could, let's, let's talk about what we can do within the family structure to, to change that situation. Um, so it's been coming up, but you know, it's uh, no one has a, a a quick answer to to the problem. Hello, um, Professor Mitchell. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe say something very brief and short about Thomas Merton. And, and what he was like, um, because mm, he's, he's been, he was a person that was very important to me in my spiritual journey. And his, his book, The Seven Story Mountain, touched me in a way no book ever has before. And I'm just curious to know what he's like, or your encounter with him. Well, I never met Merton. Um, I was in Hawaii in the Dom, Diamond Sangha, uh, uh, matter of fact, we were driving in a car, and Robert Aiken, uh, who became a Zen master, uh, said uh, that he just heard that Thomas Merton had died that day. And I didn't know who Thomas Merton was, uh, but all the Buddhists did, you know. Uh, so he had a tremendous effect on on people. Um, one of my friends was a novice master with Thomas Merton at Gethsemane. And uh, he's now a farmer. He, he left the, the monastery for the farm. And so I've talked to him about Merton. And um, the sort of the radicalism of, of his thinking, because it was during the Vietnam War, and he was very much against the war and taking very radical stands um, in, in many different ways. And then breaking into the dialogue with 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 Asia and going to Asia and all of this so he was a person that that 
took these um, positions that were unusual for a monk in a, in a Trappist monastery where you have a vow of silence. Um, but I was also told by the monks there that, that knew him that, that he was a, a man of, of deep spiritual penetration and when he would give, um, I don't remember what they call them, conferences or something like that, um, that you know everyone would be just silent. He would just, he, he, was, he had attained to such a depth within himself that uh, he moved people by wh what he said. On the other hand, I heard from a monk that sometimes he was so frustrated um, with whatever it was he was struggling with that he would go over to the wall and bang his head against the wall, which I've, I've heard that term, but I've never actually seen anybody bang their head against the wall. Um, so I think he was a multifaceted person. And uh, um, anyway, that's that's about all I can say since I didn't really ever meet him. But many people were uh, quite uh, taken by the Seven Story Mountain. I, I did go and see some of the belongings that he had there, and one was framed the um, the contract for that book, and he had written in the contract that if it ever drops below 500 copies a year, that they would continue to publish it. And it's kind of a joke because it's, it's you know, they publish many more than 500 a year ever since it was, um, or they printed many more and sold more than 500 a year since it was published. Bene, penso che il nostro tempo è finito. Thank you. Professor Mitchell, we have a gift for you. So, Sammy, if you can come. He made this statue for you. So, nel frattempo, thank you very much. Grazie. Se i nostri studenti si vogliono preparare per il secondo pezzo musicale, another song, another song. Okay. Eh, c'è anche Roberta Barcelos con noi, Bene. E, um, un bossa nova, il titolo è Wave, è di è bra brasiliano di Joe Beam. C'è il preside che forse una parola vuole. No, io voglio solo dire, e penso siete tutti d'accordo, che ormai sono 15 giorni che Dan Michel è qui con noi, si è fatto anche un percorso di dialogo insieme, lui ha lavorato anche con gli studenti, oggi ha animato questo PhD Day, cioè il giornata dei dottorandi, ed è nato in questi giorni spontanea il desiderio e l'iniziativa di eh, che lui sia, eh, come dicono in inglese, un research fellow, un professore di ricerca eh, nel corpo organico di Sofia, eh, perché eh, noi ci sentiamo enormemente arricchiti dalla sua presenza ed è nato una mezza idea, non so se Anne lo sa già e se è d'accordo, ma che ogni anno lui possa passare un periodo a Sofia per arricchirci in attesa che nasca il campus di Sofia negli Stati Uniti.
vou te contar Os olhos já não podem ver Coisas que só o coração pode entender Fundamental é mesmo o amor É impossível ser feliz sozinho O resto é mar É tudo que eu nem sei contar São coisas lindas que eu tenho pra te dar Vem de mansinho a brisa e me diz que é impossível ser feliz sozinho Da primeira vez era a cidade Da segunda o cais eternidade Agora eu já sei Da onda que seguiu no mar e das estrelas que esquecemos de contar O amor se deixa surpreender Enquanto a noite vem nos envolver Da segunda o cais eternidade Agora eu já sei Da onda que seguiu no mar E das estrelas que esquecemos de contar O amor se deixa surpreender Enquanto a noite vem nos envolver Vou te Grazie a tutti.